All right, here we go. The Donald left Mar-a-Lago and went out campaigning, getting in his workout for his presidential training. Yes, it's the same guy from the January 6th attack, but that don't deter his base because for them, the Donald is back. Your faith in the Donald is no doubt based on your belief. Larry Schultz's attitude is that Trump's campaign is comic relief. Oh, yeah. Great to be here. <laughs> you sound enthused. <laughs> <laughs> he believes the Trump tax cuts actually raise tax collections. And he believes this despite all the liberal objections. He believes the commanders played in the toughest division. And he believes this with all of his loyal rose-colored vision. But what Mike Cara believes to be the most unusual is that people who don't believe the best baseball player ever was Stan Musial. Uh, he was, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Babe Ruth wasn't bad. <laughs> Babe Ruth wasn't bad. He's no Stan Musial, though. He's the president of the Berkeley County Republican Club. That means when they held the election, he got the dub. He's on his Facebook page posing with Alex Mooney. When it came to Sheriff Harmon on that same page, he changed his toonie. But lately... <laughs> <laughs> but lately about one thing he's quiet as a church mouse in 2024 is alonzo perry once again running for the house no no I, I, no elections this year or next year since i started doing these intros and making them rhyme i've managed to work in his name with current events more than one time and coming up with this one, I'd say, was cha I, was challenging, I'd say. After all, how do you attach this guy's name to Groundhog Day? <laughs> Punxsutawney Phil clearly doesn't rhyme with the name Joe Ferretti. But you know which Groundhog does? West Virginia's own French Creek Freddy. <laughs> oh, please, no comparison, please. <laughs> My goodness. One groundhog. Rank, ranking on French Creek Freddy. <laughs> Worried about his underwear and French Creek Freddy in one day. <laughs> his not a good idea, Captain, not a good idea story is pretty amusing. It was about parking his ship and giving it a bruising. <laughs> Against better advice, he took out a chunk of the dock. And to those pedestrians who ran, it was certainly a shock. Which is why when the Admiral went car shopping on this, he insisted. These three things were priorities, these items he listed. The car must be a Tesla, and it must see in the dark. And one last thing added, Bonnie, it must also be able to self-park. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> Gentlemen, you've all been tasked with coming up with three topics of conversation this morning, one of which must be unique to you. We start with our leadoff hitter via telephone, Joe Ferretti. Rob, I was going to, as you saw from our exchange of ideas last night, I was going to chide the uh, state Republican Party uh, that we have in West Virginia for seemingly wanting to legislate in every nook and cranny of the state, but... I, uh, I'm going to resist that, and I'm going to talk about that those education forums, the focus groups, the town halls, whatever you want to call them, that were held in the fall. We recall that uh, they visited Martinsburg and elsewhere to get input from teachers and the public about what's right and what's wrong with our schools. The results are in from those meetings, and uh, pretty much I uh, understand this is coming from the, the unions uh, because they are the ones who, who put these forms together. But they distilled the concerns down to four main subjects. Re teacher retention and recruitment, number two, was student discipline. Number three was uh, mental health issues in the school, and number four was greater parental involvement. Those were the concerns raised most often in these forums as to what is wrong with our schools and how we might be able to improve them. So I thought about that, and I'm looking at uh, what the legislature is up to this session and trying to determine, is the legislature acting in ways? Are they proposing bills that are designed to address some of these concerns with our schools? So I'm wondering, for a discussion this morning, have we heard anything from the legislature that addresses any of those specific concerns, or do we think that there is something the legislature needs to do and that you hope they do to help improve our schools? 
All right, there you go. We'll start with the Admiral. Billy. Yeah, uh, good points, Joe. I, I think the legislators have been involved with one of those four, and that's the discipline. There's a couple of mo- uh, couple of bills, uh, proposed bills that's coming through the system. I do not have not seen yet anything that deals with the other three, the retention, the mental health, or the uh, uh, parental in- involvement. Uh, the the to me a more fundamental question is uh, the involvement of the legislators at all. Uh, schools have been more or less defaulted to the governor unless the educators want to get involved in certain things of what uh, what courses have been taught, what or not to be taught. Uh, I think we need to have a better. Uh, cooperative engagement between the legislators and the and the governor to address these four critical points i applaud the schools for uh synthesizing or reducing all the school issues down to four things four categories which could be should be addressed but will they be addressed i've seen no evidence of it at all larry um yeah, short of in God we trust uh, being legislated into the uh, the daily school thing, I'm not hearing very much at all about the schools. And if the legislature doesn't like the way, and then they kind of indicated that by the amendments they put forth, doesn't like the way the state school board um, takes all the power and seems to uh, be unanswerable to anybody, then they need to have some answers. Um, you know, I blame the state school board for those four issues as well. But the legislature has to have real answers, not cultural meddling about religion and critical race theory, real answers about education. And they don't seem to have any either. Michael? Well, first of all, Amendment 4, which the school unions helped defeat, along with the governor, was designed to do just what you called for, was to give the legislature input into the operation of schools. Secondly, remember, as I think it was recognized at the beginning of this, the the teachers' unions really influenced the selection of these issues. Something that is happening, there are several bills in the legislature that require testing and achievement on, you know, on on learning, you know, not 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 dealing with violence or mental health, but on on learning subjects, important basic subjects to move forward, and that will require the teachers to do their job, and that's why school choice is important because you get some competition, and so there is progress being made, and and I you know I don't know if those bills any of them are going to pass, but they're they're out there now. Alonzo. I mean, I see, you know, uh, the opposite of uh, a lot of people that have put, you know, their uh, comments on this. I, it's, it's funny to me because I believe we're doing a, a, an extremely big pay raise for teachers. I believe that uh, the school discipline bill, while it's, you know, just kind of getting shrugged over, this is significant. This is something that is providing data. You know, um, one of the issues is if a teacher was to remove a student out of a classroom before, there was almost no documentation. And the bill, uh, House Bill 2890, does a good job of allowing to see what is causing the issues in the classrooms. Now, there is a clause in it that says something with personality clashes, and I do find that a little troubling that, you know, a teacher can remove a student based off personality clashes. And I I, I don't like that provision. I wish that the amendment on that part of the bill was... um, slashed and um, you know but this will give us some insight into what the actual issues are and I like the the way that this is producing data as for um, you know mental health or parental involvement um, I believe that there should be a parental bill of rights that should have passed in order to you know allow uh, parents to have more rights to what quality of education their children is receiving more information and um, you know give them an avenue because I feel like you know it's not so much that parents don't want to be involved but a lot of the times is they don't even know where to start and you know we we need to tell them where you know uh, their rights go and how far you know does it have in 
their child's education. And then for mental health, I mean, I, I'm not sure exactly where we want the government to, to involve themselves in this role or, or what we can do to help, you know, with counselors and showing kids, you know, what different avenues they have. But um, I, I disagree. I think that all four of these issues are being, you know, dealt with very well in the legislature this year. And um, I'm glad to see, you know, that they're putting in uh, an effort to fix these issues. The issue of parental rights is a fascinating one because you, I hear from parents the need for a, a bill of parental rights, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But when we have teachers on the program, they say when it's parent-teacher conference night, nobody shows. Maybe one person shows, and that's the person who's got a kid who's got a 4.6 grade point average with advanced placement courses, that sort of thing. The, the parents that they really need to see, the parents of the troubles, troubled kids, the underachieving kids aren't there. They're not showing up for the parent-teachers meetings. So if I've got on one pile a bunch of parents who say we need parents' rights when it comes to education and more parental involvement in the curriculum in the classroom, and I've got teachers on the other side saying, okay, but where are you when it's time to talk about your kids' academic status and behavioral issues in the classroom? You're not there. We're, we're, what's missing in the middle here? Uh, you know, I, and this is just, you know, um, one of the positions that I feel – um, is is interesting because, you know, the kids that probably need, you know, the most help with, you know, academic achievement and issues, a lot of their issues do stem from the home. And that's where, you know, we need to figure out um, how do we fix that problem? If it is starting in the home, you know, uh, maybe not having the government involved in this issue, but, you know, can teachers not reach out to parents? Can they not call? I mean, I'm sure there's a number on site. I'm sure that, you know, uh, there needs to be more avenues available for, you know, parent-teacher conferences, whether it's Zoom calls, whether it's, you know, I mean, we live in the 21st century now, and it's time for us to, you know, make this more accessible because a lot of people are, you know, uh, struggling to make ends meet. We, you know, have people that uh, um, are, are working full time, have irregular schedules. And uh, it's not so much that I don't feel like, you know, parents want to be involved in their kids, but I do think that there's an issue with uh, knowing where to start, you know, and um, that's where we can try to, you know, uh, alleviate some of that issue. I think, you know, Joe, Al oh, well, go ahead, Bill, go ahead. Alonzo, you mentioned that these uh, legislators are addressing all four of these issues. Mm -hmm. I am not aware of that. Are they still in committee di uh, discussion? Have any of them passed uh, in all four of these categories, with the exception of discipline? We, we've heard about that one. The other ones I've not heard about. I think that the uh, biggest things that are passing or on the way of passing is that House Bill 2890, which deals with school discipline, yeah. and then the teacher raises. I think that with those two, I think that that's uh, fixing at least two of the four problems. As for mental health and parental involvement, I think that, you know, uh, the issue with mental health is often, you know, te or quality of teachers is, you know, uh, the, the, the environment that the students are being placed in. And it's almost as if, uh, you know, for to fix those problems, it's almost an auxiliary or a corollary of what you're getting with these other bills. But has there been discussion, and there may have been, I'm not aware of it, has there been serious discussion on these four categories, retention, uh, raising the uh, raising the teachers' uh, salaries. Yes, we need that. That's been done, every, been discussed every year. But is that the only thing that we need to be looking at for retention? My question is, has there been serious discussion on the part of the legislators of how to address these four categories? I mean, you have to think if the teachers don't feel that they have the tools to do their job to effectively teach, right? Uh, you know then they're not going to want to stay in schools in West Virginia. And so by doing things like providing a school discipline policy, which is allowing them to have more tools uh, that's that's backing them, this is for them, you know, and this isn't some type of uh, government overreach or, or painted in some way that, you know, uh, it's not deciding, you know, what is best from the legislature. It's allowing the teachers to decide, you know, what is best and also, you know, um, back them because what's happening is you know kids are getting suspended or kids are you know facing in school suspension and there's no information or no dialogue that's happening you know on the teacher's behalf to show why this student is being disruptive in the classroom you know by creating a working environment where they're able to you know voice their concerns write and document what is happening and uh, being provided with those tools that does help with teacher retention it's not a direct uh, uh, 
thing, but it's one of those aspects that I feel like provide a better environment. I agree with that. That's that's not the point. My point is, has the legislators taken taken an active role in discussing how to address and rectify these problems? I think that, you know, uh, I would defer to, to Mike Carl's answer in that, that saying that, you know, uh, the amendment for that, you know, allowed the legislature to have more of an aspect in education would have definitely, you know, promoted that type of but that's that's, that's, that that's water over the bridge. Mm-hmm. That's water over the bridge. But so. that's that that it's a barrier. You know, uh, when we say that the state board is completely autonomous and there's no way for, you know, the legislature to intervene in its policy making or develop anything uh, you know, with how policies work, then, I mean, what can you really do to create a better environment for your teachers to practice in the state of West Virginia? The, the other part of my answer was, not past Amendment 4, was that there are bills, several bills, that are looking at the academic achievement and requiring it, and, and I don't know how strong they're going to be to enforce or require the teachers to to, to carry out their their job, which is to teach basic subjects, and and so the students can prove that they've learned something, mm-hmm. holding students accountable. Yes, and how, Joe, teachers back, and and students. Joe, back to you for a moment. Well, let, let me uh, try to answer Bill's question too, because uh, I, in thinking about this subject, I, I did try to look back at what the legislature has been working on here the past four or five weeks and i think it's a mixed bag in terms of how they're responding to these concerns there is a bill pending for a large teacher pay increase um, a really historically high increase where the starting salary for a teacher in west virginia would go from an average of thirty nine thousand to forty four thousand dollars with salaries above that level being adjusted accordingly uh, that's not a 5% increase. That's a large increase that uh, right now is pending. I don't know if it's going to pass, but it is obviously uh, from the school and the teacher's perspective a step in the right direction. Student discipline, we, we do know there's a bill, as Alonzo said, that's pending on that. And I think that's designed to give superintendents and principals a little bit more backbone uh, to discipline students who are disruptive, who are stopping learning, in, in the classroom and, and with some sort of plan or design of what to do with those students whenever they need to be removed from a classroom setting. So I thought that was a step in the right direction. Uh, now, with regard to mental health, I don't see anything being done by the legislature. And that's a broad subject because it involves school psychologists and school counselors, and it dovetails nicely into the discipline issue. When these students are removed from the classroom, teachers will tell you there's nowhere to put them. What do we do with them? The principals will tell you we we don't have a place in school to keep them for in-school suspension. Oftentimes they're returned back to the classroom after getting a good talking to, perhaps with some more counselors and and, uh, the infrastructure in the school to do this. Those students can be placed in an area where there can be meaningful discussions about what school's about and how they're inhibiting their classmates from learning. Uh, so that I don't see anything going on with that, and that's just going to take more money, just like it is with the teacher's aides in the primary grades. And lastly, parental involvement. Uh, you know, what you'll hear from the school personnel is they don't, they're don't not so much concerned about parental bill of rights, uh, where curriculum is going to suddenly be a, a hot issue to discuss. They want parents taking a vested interest in their children's learning. And when their children aren't learning, as reflected in the report cards they bring home, they want those parents coming in to see teachers to discuss that. And that's not happening. And part of that is that the report cards reflect the actual achievement and not just moving them on. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good point. And, and that, the, the, the corollary to that is that if you don't achieve, you've got to be held back. Yes, absolutely. The, the uh, difficulty with the parental bill of rights I think what Joe is trying to say is perhaps we need a parental bill of duties. (laughs) And there are things you need to do. When the teacher calls you and says Johnny is losing it, and and look, a lot of parents don't understand this because they themselves were raised in households where that wasn't really a big deal. Uh, But 
for anyone who was raised in a different kind of household, oh boy, when when the call came from the school that you were screwing around in class, um, everything in in my family stopped <laughs> until that got ad- addressed. And uh, you know, the, my dad was a school teacher, and so he was sending those out to other people's families, and he was darned if he was going to let that slide uh, with my brothers and me. Uh, that we were the main culprits, not so much my sisters. Um, to this day, Larry still wears padding in his pants. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we, it's, it's true. We can't also take you know silence from parents as saying that it's uh, you know they need to be more involved, and you know this shows that they they have no lack or vested interest into the classroom. That's that's not true. I think that, you know, a lot of them are satisfied. If you're quiet about an issue, especially when it has to do with, you know, government, a lot of the times it's because you're happy with the conditions that are being set. Um, you know, that's why I'm advocating for something like a, a parental bill of rights because it's, it's there for those that are not satisfied. And I think that a lot of the times that, you know, um, kids or parents, they know their kids. You know, they know what their kids can achieve. And uh, this is one of those things that, you know, um, taking a, a broad view of the issue, it's not so much that, you know, um, these parents are, are not, they could not even be aware of the actual issues that are happening in the classroom a lot of the times. And, uh, you know, we can't sit here and say the parents, you know, must be in there calling, emailing, doing everything, you know, to try to reach the teacher. Maybe sometimes we need to give and pull in that aspect of you know well, uh, creating dialogue according to many of the comments on our facebook page and when we've talked about this before the teachers do reach out in many cases and a lot of former teachers who listen to this program say they did the same when they were there that that's already taking place and underway and it still doesn't change the results in many cases we do have to take our break here and we will be back with more bill is on the clock and then alonzo in our uh, first half hour of the nine o'clock hour good morning rob i'm going to bring us back to a subject we've talked about a lot the last few weeks and that's the tax cut uh i would not have mentioned this last week because i thought it was on uh on a roll and it's not going to be stopped it probably still is that way it will it's probably going to happen but this past week a couple of three things have emerged one governor justice was um, uh was in town for a town hall meeting uh and there was a vocal group uh that said wait a minute uh we would prefer the money to be spent on infrastructure needs. Uh, now, John Hardy earlier addressed that by saying they were not representative of the full population. They were a very small subpopulation. Uh, we had the, um, uh, the policy outreach director for West Virginia Center of Budget and Policy. And as Rob keeps uh, mentioning, this is not an official government organization. This is a private organization. But the, uh, the outreach director said basically the same thing that we saw here in Martinsburg. He said he's been to a lot of town hall meetings, and every one of them are fairly consistent that they would like to see the money redirected more than just uh, tax cuts. Now, admittedly, he is a, uh, uh, this is a, uh, a liberal progressive uh, organization, so he's going to hear what he wants to hear. But one on the conservative side, uh, Senator uh, Eric Tarr, uh, is raising some fundamental questions as well. And basically what he's saying is, do we, we have a lot of needs in the state? Uh, and uh, we need to address the needs. Can we address these needs and the tax cut the same time? Uh, he is saying that uh, we need a long-range plan and ne- it needs to be vetted or looked at more closely than what the House has done. Uh, Eric Tarr is not accepting on face value the governor's or Dave Hardy's uh, uh, budget numbers. And Eric Tarr is a CPA, so he knows numbers. Uh, to me, it kind of boils down to a couple of issues. One, uh, do numbers justify uh, a tax cut as we propose? The flip side is... The Republicans have always considered a tax cut to be basic to their DNA. They, they view tax cuts to be healthy to the economy. We have a supermajority uh, with the Republicans now. The question to my esteemed 
colleagues is can the legislators afford not to pass a personal tax reduction at this time. All right. Nobody knows more about taxes in this room than the former tax commissioner of the state of West Virginia, Michael Carl. Thank you for that compliment. You're quite welcome, sir. Uh, It's not either or. You can improve the government, and part of the way improving the government is improve the tax system. And, And it has to be done carefully and with study and and you know probably phased in uh but it 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 absolutely can be done that that's if you and and this laps over to something bill and i have discussed recently you cut the taxes and you raise the tax revenue because it stimulates the economy now the spending side is is real important and has to be managed properly and and uh you know that's 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 really what Tar is saying, in in many ways. In, in effect, that's what he's saying. All right, Joe Ferretti via telephone. Well, Bill, I, I think the Republicans have to pass something to answer your question, because as John Hardy has repeatedly said, they can't keep coming on the radio or going into uh, other media. Uh, talking about how well this state is doing and all these surpluses and not give some money back. So I think they feel the onus to do some sort of tax cut. And I think it's going to happen, just not at levels that the governor is currently proposing. In fact, the governor is already backtracking and saying he's willing to compromise on that 50 percent number. And the reason why he has to is because the bill is coming due from flatline budgets that have held spending in check while we have jailhouse doors, locks that don't work. And while we don't have, we have the state national guard manning prisons. And while we have foster care systems in, in, in disarray, uh, those bills have to be paid. And I think that the Senate recognizes that to do both is possible, but I, whether they can get to yes is another matter. And, and I think that the personality conflicts that exist, I think there's a real risk here. I, I, I would say maybe 10 or 20 percent, but there's a risk that they get nothing done. But I think they have to because uh, you, you can't keep extolling the virtues of the West Virginia revenue side of, of the economy and, and not get some sort of tax relief. Alonzo. I don't think that there's going to be any punishment, per se, uh, if if there isn't a income tax or PIT reduction. I don't I don't think that they'll be penalized in in any way for not accomplishing it. But one of the things that I find interesting is that um, kind of like what Mark, Mike Carl says is it's not an ultimatum. You know, there, there's there is a third option here. There's not you know just saying you know we can't afford the tax cut or. Um, we essentially need to raise spending or, you know, the, it, it, it's not an ultimatum. We're not being provided with, um, you know, all of the options here. I mean, we could always reduce the size of government. You know, I've, I've been on here before and I talked about how um, we have a, a, a purchasing department that's responsible for purchasing all, purchasing all of the, the things for government. We have a hiring department and it slows the rate of employment in the state. I mean, we never talk about reducing or actually making government smaller. We never talk about streamlining. We never talk about, uh, you know, focusing on priorities. You know, that, I mean, that's where our, uh, being a good steward of taxpayer money is. And I think that we can't afford uh, a tax cut, a, a significant tax cut. And I agree with the House. But I don't think that there will be any, uh, you know, anything that will affect the Senate's position in that aspect. I don't think they'll, it'll hurt them. Larry. Um, I believe that there are a lot of, as Alonzo was saying, there are an awful lot of spending requirements that are going to need to be addressed, not just a cut of taxes. So somewhere we have to come up with the money. You know, they're talking about uh, raising teacher pay substantially. Um, How much of that surplus will be eaten up by that move? And obviously, you need to play those two things off. It's not just how much can we cut the taxes. It's how much do we need to increase the budget to meet our responsibilities that we're not meeting now, uh, like foster care and other things. They just announced, by the way, a 20% raise for foster care workers, the CPS workers. 
Um, it's going to be interesting to see if that works to start reducing the number of vacancies. But the purpose of the government is not to come out with a certain number at the bottom of the balance sheet. It's to make the state a better place for the citizens to live and to more efficiently govern um, not just the money, but the activities of the government. So it, to the extent that they focus solely on tax relief, they've really missed the boat. You've got to have both. Goes back to you, Bill. Yeah, and uh, and uh, Larry brought up uh, my summary point, and I, I want to pick up on what Mike Carl's been telling us for several several years. Our income tax structure, our tax structure requires basic reform, structural reform, and what we're defaulting to now is just a tax cut. Uh, I still think we're missing the opportunity for a structural reform of a tax. Well, and that's a fair point. We had uh, Ken Apple, who's a CPA, in earlier this week. He pointed out some of the inconsistencies in the West Virginia tax code that we thought were going to be addressed before this giant surplus landed on everybody's head like a safe fallen from the sky. And it totally changed the we need West Virginia tax reform to how will we give this money back to people in the process tax reform has been overlooked. For instance, there's still a marriage penalty in the state of West Virginia. Uh, there is still a top-end tax bracket that's been in place long enough that the inflation adjusting rate of it should be 128000 but it's still at $60,000. Uh, the state still taxes things for retirees that some of the surrounding states do not. There are many things in the state of West Virginia tax code that could be and should be fixed, Mike Carl, and I know you identified many of these things previously. Well, I, I agree. There's there's a lot. Of, the structure needs to be reviewed and adjusted and improved, it's including the the property tax situation. Uh, and and some good news, you know, trying to be a little optimistic. There 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 is a bill I mentioned it earlier uh, that that would give both personal income tax credit and a corporate income tax credit for property tax paid on vehicles that's you know that's the 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 convoluted way to to adopt amendment two but but so i agree that that the structure the system the concept needs to be changed but anybody who thinks that jim justice has the understanding he he understands what advances his uh interest and he learned a real big lesson when he took over and we we were facing Deficits, and he wanted to make them worse. And the legislature taught him, and he 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 clearly accepted the lesson he was taught by the Republican legislature. And that so let's don't give him credit for for the concept. Let's give him credit if he wants to be a leader and do the right thing for West Virginia. He will pay attention to what the legislature is telling him, including the Senate. Issue number three. We move on to Alonzo Perry. Yeah. So. We're going to talk about uh, form energy and those investments. So uh, to give everyone in the audience a background, Governor Justice announced in December that Form Energy will partner with the state of West Virginia to build its first iron air battery manufacturing facility on 55 acres of property in the northern panhandle of West Virginia. Delegate Pat McGeehan raised concerns about the financial ties of Form Energy it has with uh, foreign interests, and he's asking for the company to provide with a list of its investors and their background. Form Energy develops energy storage systems, and they're going to be building them in Hancock County. To close the deal, Form Energy was asking for another $215 million in tax subsidies that the state legislature must approve, and this was along with the uh, allocation of $75 million that was already put towards the purchase of the land and the construction. Uh, Delegate McGeehan said, I have a lot of concerns, and not just with uh, the investment, but it seems to be of rather troubling character, in his own words. And to begin, he said that Form Energy is a startup company that only exists on paper. They have a website. That's all. Typically, state government doesn't get involved in startups because of the risk. Uh, he said, then there's the company's backers. He said that they're owned by Saudi-owned oil company and private groups that have ties with communist China. And they also have the opportunity to undermine American energy interdependence. So McGeehan added that he's not even cer certain that Form Energy has a viable product. He claims that the new improved battery that can store energy, but 
they're not sure if they're going to release it yet or show what they can say that they do. Um, so what I'm going to ask the group today is essentially, uh, what are we willing to sacrifice for economic development? And do you think that he is justified in questioning about the company's legitimacy and its investors? Joe, let's go to you on the phone first. Well, the thing that I, I don't know well enough to comment on is, is to what extent state government does feasibility studies with some of these startup companies that come forward seeking all kind of state uh, tax breaks and financial support to get started. You know, the state owns the land, the state owns the buildings, and the state gives them tax breaks. And in essence, the state almost guarantees that there's no risk for these private investors. And I, Pat McGeehan has a point. If some of those private investors are Chinese interests, uh, you know, we're, we're basically subsidizing that. And, and to what end? if this is not a viable enterprise. So I don't know what feasibility work is done in the background. I can't really comment on it. I just hope it's being done. But uh, let, let's, yeah, another point I would make about this uh, is that the Form Energy, uh, one of the uh, principals who spoke at the governor's uh, press conference about this, said that one of the reasons why this company even has their, their blueprint on paper as to how they can perhaps increase battery technology is because of the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed by Congress supporting these kinds of ventures. Uh, now, that, that, again, cuts both ways. Now we got the federal government also providing uh, subsidies and, and financial support for these companies, uh, which is another, again, issue that we can talk about. But overall, uh, this and many other of these company announcements in West Virginia are a direct result of federal spending. So uh, we can, we got to look at that in a different light, too. But all, overall, I just hope that before the state starts cutting all these breaks, that their understanding of these good businesses are going to have uh, the ability to go forward and actually employ people in the state. Larry? Yeah, I was uh, caught from the very beginning by the phrase energy storage systems. Um, you know, um, my friends in Ontario would call that a lake uh, uh, caused by a dam on a river. That's an energy storage system. You turn the turbines, and there's your power, right? Um, I guessed uh, uh, before you actually said it that they're a battery manufacturer. I guess the very first thing, and I know that wasn't your term. That was their term. The very first thing I would like to see from these companies is tell me in plain language what you actually do. Energy storage. This is coming from a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Tell me in plain language what you actually do. And and that, 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 that makes me nervous about these people, regardless of what else you say. That, uh, you, you know, if they're a battery manufacturer, uh, you know, is it are they lithium batteries? What's your source of lithium? I mean, yeah, th those are things that a state that's going to invest in a non-startup had better take very seriously in the way that Joe was talking about with feasibility studies. And, you know, I don't know whether Mr. McGeehan's facts are correct or not, but the fact that he says those things ought to lead somebody to investigate and answer his questions. Billy? Yeah, uh, question, was it lead or lithium? I thought you said lead. Uh, it it doesn't even Oh, it does mention. not mention. Okay, I misread it. Just, that. But, yeah, I what bothers me is that with a surplus of money, it can go a lot of different ways, one of which is with our development authority would feel more generous in giving money to companies. Startup companies, by definition, are uh, uh, have promise, but there's also a tremendous amount of risk involved. We do need to have research. We do need to have a stake in the ground for batteries. Uh, that's going to be the the industry of the future as we break through batteries uh, and whoever's holding the batteries or manufacturing is going to be an advantage. That could be a great upside to our state. But the way you've read the article, I knew nothing about it at all, Alonzo, until you read it this morning to mm -hmm. us. Uh, I don't know any of the details, but there are questions that Pat McGinn raises that's uh, that troublesome, primarily with the startup. The financial investors, uh, the backers, doesn't bother me as much. Uh, but the uh, how much how much are the how much will the state be invested into a technology that would be very iffy in getting off the ground is worrisome. Mm -hmm. Michael. Well, I agree 
basically with everything that's that's been said, I uh, I am concerned about the, if if the truth about the who's behind it uh, is, is established, then that's even a more of a concern. It's it's not it's not something just to blow off like Bill says, but uh, <laughs> absolutely we need to look into it and and develop answer these questions before we commit at all. And it goes back to you, Alonzo. Yeah, no, I, I, it pains me to say, but I agree with Larry wholeheartedly. <laughs> and, uh, I think that there's. Uh, <laughs> How do you like getting agreed with like that, Larry? <laughs> but I, I'm glad that it causes pain. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting reaction. That's a sign of progress. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that there are legitimate questions being raised here, and you know, I wish that there was more of this. I feel like a lot of the times, you know, um, we see these things happening, and I think that it was really interesting that uh, you know, Delegate McGee and brought this up and said, you know, hey, wait a second, you know, why are we investing in a startup company? And, you know, I I think that there are interests a lot of the times that, you know, are against uh, what our values are. And I think that, you know, sacrificing economic development a lot of the times for, you know, uh, our security and uh, and our energy independence is very important. And that's all I have to say on that. Brings us back in some ways to TikTok, I guess, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. We're on to issue uh, number four, and for that we go to attorney at law Larry Schultz. Yes, my question for the panel is whether Sheriff Nate Harmon made a mistake by appearing at the scene of his daughter's accident a few weeks ago. Um, I know that it's not over. There are still people talking about it. There are some people who are very agitated on both sides of this issue. Um, One of them, uh, frankly, my wife, who says, hey, if my kid's involved in an accident and I can go there, I'm going there. I want to make sure my kid's okay. And that's any parent understands that. The problem he has is a problem we face in attorney discipline cases sometimes. There's improper behavior. And then there's this other category called the appearance of impropriety. And what he's got, to the extent that he's at the scene talking to the investigating officers before they have reached their conclusions, some would argue that that's an appearance of impropriety, that he might have um, intended to put a thumb on the scale or it might appear that he attended, intended to put. Look, I don't blame any parent who's uh, scared for the security of their child. Uh, you know, that's a difficult situation. I'm not sure that the sheriff fully understood how it would look for him to appear there, especially since, as it worked out, she was not ticketed. She was not given a... a, a a ticket of any kind, apparently, from this event. I don't know, I haven't heard this, uh, whether a warning was given. We sometimes have auto accident cases where a warning is given. Um, and, and you know, it really doesn't have any effect on your license, cost you any points or money, but it is a warning. I guess if you did it again a few weeks later, they'd say, okay, the warning didn't work, right? Um in any event, I, I, you know, my sympathies are with the sheriff as a father, but he he was playing two roles on that night. And perhaps uh, there are some who will think that he should have paid more attention to his official role than he did because of this appearance of impropriety. Okay. We have uh, two other lawyers on the program today. I'll start with the one on the telephone first, Joe. Boy, tough, tough question, Larry, because um, as a parent, every instinct you have is going to be go to the scene and make sure your child is okay. And I don't care who you are, whether you're the sheriff of the county, uh, whether you're uh, a deputy or, or an attorney or a doctor or, or you know, anybody in any walk of life is going to want to go and first be assured that their child is good and then take it from there. Now, where perhaps it crossed the line is the conduct that takes place at the scene, uh, where once you know your child is okay, in the position that Nate Harmon found himself, should he have immediately then stepped away uh, 
and, and, and you know, done nothing with regard to the investigation. And, and I think that there can be some debate about that particular aspect of this. But look, as a parent, you're going to automatically assume that your child made some bad decisions that led to the car wreck. So your, your inclination is to get there and make sure the child doesn't continue to make bad decisions, such as securing the vehicle, getting the vehicle towed, securing property inside the vehicle, things of that nature. Uh, that's just parenting. And uh, so I, I don't think that we can be all that critical of him arriving at the scene what happens afterwards is uh, obviously what we're debating in, in our in our uh, community. And next, Attorney Michael Carl. Uh, I wasn't. I haven't heard what law enforcement agency was actually investigating or arrived at the scene. I'm pretty sure it's the sheriff's department. It was, it was, so, so that makes it even stronger the, the influence. I mean, even even the state police, or city police, would be presumed to have some receive some influence from the sheriff but but that makes it even worse but uh, I, I i agree with all these points being made about parental instincts and and but the the in retrospect you know now i'm sitting here <laughs> talking about it, I'm, I'm not the father of the scene uh he, he if he had m- made a statement to his subordinates who were investigating the matter you do what you, you investigate this and, and take such action that you think is necessary i'm just concerned about her safety and and if he could if that were on the record then this that would be a good statement to exactly get on the body the, the, cam. Exa- yeah. Yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly but but that otherwise these issues are all you know it's a it's a great conflict between a parental instincts and official duties I'm going to go to Alonzo next because you've been very outspoken about this on your Facebook page, including changing your mind on the whole issue. Uh, well, no, uh, I haven't changed my mind. You know, and, and despite popular belief, there is no uh, versatility of my convictions on this matter. What I've always advocated for is looking at the entirety of the situation and waiting for information to come out, waiting for it to be, uh, you know, uh, looked at by the special prosecutor and not indicting someone in the court of uh, public opinion and that's what we've been witnessing um, I, it's not so much that I think that you know um, Sheriff Harmon should walk away scotch free or uh, now he should be you know indicted no absolutely not I want to know more information about the events and when people had come forward and put posts out that uh, are contrary to um, you know my initial stance of waiting for what to come out that new information it came to light and i said well if this is true this is you know dastardly this does not look good for the sheriff now uh one of the things that we aren't talking about is the the facts of the matter right and uh our sheriffs uh in the state of west virginia are not employed or or can be fired simply by the sheriff's wave of a wand despite popular belief or the narrative you know there's civil servants there's a civil servants commission that's responsible for all of that and it's going to be hard to show some impropriety in this you know um as for you know whether or not he should have showed up to the scene you know uh, I understand your guys' argument as a parent, but, you know, there is a higher level of scrutiny when you're an elected official and the conduct that you take. And I can understand, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and he probably shouldn't have shown up. But, um, you know, from someone that's in that line of work that sees, you know, horrific accidents, uh, you know, traumatic, you know, events like that, you know, your initial impact of the of hearing about this event your kid was in an accident i'm sure you know his heart dropped to his stomach probably even further than people that aren't familiar with the tragedies of a car accident and that's something that we have to take into account um if there is impropriety and i hope that the special investigator tells us what charges are being pursued i want to know physically what is he being accused of because i don't think that they've even released that um and i want to know you know um, what does this investigation include? You know, is it um, are the numbers that said that there was you know a, a DUI or uh, uh, she breath she was breathalyzed or whatever? Is there evidence of this? How are they going to even find that? You know, um, was there any issue with uh, him calling? Uh, I guess his uh, niece and and did he try to coerce her to to say something that you know is against the actual narrative of the story 
Um, these are good questions to ask. And if he's guilty of that, then I want him prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And that's been my position this entire time, despite, you know, being able to watch people that are from out of state, you know, start to talk about issues that affect our county. You know, we, we are the recipients of this and we are going to pay the cost for, you know, this issue. And too many people that are from outside of here have a lot to say about what's happening and something that affects all of us. Bill, yeah, uh, for removals can only be done through impeachment, so it's not a it's not a trivial task. Uh, the other thing is, I do not fault the sheriff for going to the scene. Mm -hmm. Where I have problems, and where I would advise the sheriff is after the fact, trying to get ahead of the information. He should have uh, said that we we got a, a special investigator looking at it. I'm not going to make any comments until the special investigator has had their report. He's been crucified by social media. Some of what he tried, he brought on himself by trying to influence the public perception. That should be done by the public by the by the uh, special investigator. And by the way, I don't know that we do we have verification that there has been a special investigator appointed. I know it was requested, but they don't have to grant that request. Yeah, I don't. I don't know of any. I know in Morgan County we've got a similar situation with the matter that happened at the Troubadour Lounge, and indeed they've named an investigator from the statewide state police uh, hierarchy that will be conducting that investigation. I presume this is the same yeah. sort of thing. I, I disagree with with. Uh bill too that you know he shouldn't have said anything you know uh, he's an office or he's always been you know someone that has uh, champion transparency and i love the fact that he released you know the body cam footage i love the fact that you know he drafted a statement i love the fact that you know uh I, coming on the radio i don't think was you know the most uh, thought out aspect of it and i don't think that you know there was enough um you know, media training for that type of event. And I do think that it looked bad. I think it looked terrible. You know, um, I, I, I wish that, you know, that was uh, done in a, in a different manner on, for his sake, because, uh, you know, but you have to be in front of these things. You know, you can't allow people to write the narrative for you. You must also have a competing, you know, uh, uh, story or whatever that dispels a lot of rumors and things that aren't fact. Because when you allow things to just circulate and build or whatnot, it really is a, a character assassination as opposed to looking at the merits of the uh, issue at hand. And I think that a lot of people right now, you know, they're not looking at the issue at hand. They're, they're accusing someone of a, a very heinous crime, which is corruption, you know, which is, I mean, you know, uh, it's devastating. It's devastating to have that on your name and on your, you know, um, uh, on your person. So I just, I don't think that uh, just being quiet about it and saying, you know, oh, well, I'm just going to let someone, you know, adjudicate this event for me and i have no say on the matter i, I don't think that that's i think it's ill-advised comes back to you larry yeah the in the final analysis the crucial thing here is not the reputation of the sheriff or of his daughter but the reputation of the thing that could affect us all the berkeley county sheriff's department Mm -hmm. And so that's the the lens through which we must look at this, and that's the analysis we have to make. Has the Berkeley County Sheriff's Department been had its reputation harmed by this? Uh, I'm not qualified to answer that question, and anybody without the investigator's report in front of them is probably going to be sorry if they try to analyze that question now because they're going to find out facts they didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, hey, Larry? Uh, yeah. And let me just add to that a uh, good point you made, because that, that really should be our focus. Uh, when the sheriff was on the show, uh, we asked him, is there an internal policy at the sheriff's department whenever there are investigations, uh, maybe it's an auto accident, maybe it's something else, that involves somehow a relationship to the sheriff the deputies, and the many people who work on the staff of Berkeley County Sheriff's Department. Do, is there a policy on how to handle those matters? And I don't think we got a really good answer on that. And it would seem to me there should be. So the conflicts of interest like this, there, there's at least something, some guide 
to follow, some policy to follow so that the public is assured that everybody is treated equally under the law. Uh, I think that's what we're all looking for here. And I didn't get the sense that the Sheriff's Department has any policies in place to give us that assurance. He used the term standard practice as opposed to written procedures. No response? Yeah. All right. Hey, uh, we, any final thoughts on this? If not, fine. If no, not. I, 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 yeah, that, that was uh, that was my thought. And, and I, I, yeah, Bill, you may be correct on that, but I just think think about how many people employed by that department. Uh, they, they reach out a lot of areas of the community, and there's got to be conflicts that arise probably frequently, and, and I think they would have some kind of policy on how to handle that. Yeah, Joe, I was actually reinforcing what you said. I was looking for written policy for these, and the sheriff kept coming back, said, no, we don't have necessarily written policy. We have standard right. practice. The standard practice is an in interpretation of the individual as opposed to written right. policy. Exactly. And we move on to issue number five, and Mike Carl, the anchor leg of the relay. My my other two subjects were well covered, so I'll move to my final one, and, and that is the prospect, the scenario by which Joe Manchin would be a candidate in the Democratic primary for President of the United States <laughs> in twenty four, and uh, it, it uh, obviously if something you know literally happens to to Joe Biden, it's not just the continued political mistakes and downfall but i i think that there 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 the there's certain element of the traditional democratic party that would encourage that and support that to move and it would if 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 it were at all successful it would take away some of the new base that the republicans have started to gain or or the non-voters that the democrats have lost uh, by a more moderate, middle of the road, uh, democratic leader. So, so I, I I think there's some prospect of that. Uh, and in fact, if if he actually were successful in in being nominated, might he might not even carry West Virginia in the primary. But I'll tell you, he would carry West Virginia in the general election. So, uh, I, I think there's a. And, and and the other side of it is there's such a dearth of, you know, qualified uh, leaders on the Democratic side. That's why Biden is president now. That same dearth of leaders, of, of credible leaders, existed back when he was elected. And that's how he got the nomination in the first place. So, so uh, I, I think there's a, a case can be made that this could play out. All right, let's go to the king of moderation himself, Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, I I agree uh, with you in part, Mike. I think if he was able to survive the primary, he would be a very viable candidate in the general. But for the primary, that's a big hurdle. I'll ask you a question. Would you vote for Liz Cheney in the Republican primary? <laughs> Are you kidding? Uh, exactly right. That, you've answered my question, but, but Liz Cheney is not Joe Manchin. Yeah, but, That's a huge difference. In the Boy, eyes, in the eyes of, so of depend, <laughs> depending on who the Republicans nominate, I might vote for Joe Manchin in the, the primary because I, I could, you know. You, but but you can't. Uh, well, you I could. Not, I, I, I might even go to the trouble of changing my registration. <laughs> Well, this is going to be a promo. <laughs> yeah. that, that was a little extreme. That was, that was a little extreme. <laughs> Poor Alonzo. But, you know, but, but they should be president of the Republican but, Club, and now they're abandoning it. But you don't have to be a Democrat to make a contribution to a Democrat's campaign. That's correct. That is correct. Bill, was that your your one line? Was would you vote for Liz Cheney? Exactly. Is that it? I think that sums everything up. <laughs> Larry Schultz. Um, the whole concept is, uh, while certainly Joe Manchin might develop in his own mind the belief that uh, he could perhaps sneak through a primary and then win the general and be president of the United States, I, I'm having a hard time seeing how this turns out as anything but terrible for West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> if he were to do it... Um, he would get pounded routinely in the, you know, in the, not just, uh, he might uh, do okay in the Iowa caucuses, but when they go to the states where there's large uh, 
uh, groups of Democrats, whether the big Democratic leaning states in Michigan, oh boy, would he be in trouble. Um, they, they they would like him about as much as Michigan people like Rich Rodriguez right now. <laughs> <laughs> West Virginia's in the same pot. Joe Ferretti, to you. Well, with the disclaimer that I have no affiliation with Joe Manchin, the person, uh, and frankly don't know what he's doing. Uh, uh, look, if he decides or decides not to run for president, it, it's not for a lack of uh, exploring because we know for a fact that he's had – uh, fundraisers with some very big dollar people, and I think there was one in Florida here a few months ago, uh, with this issue circulating around as to whether or not he's a viable candidate. From a West Virginia perspective, and is, is one that uh, wants to see a, a robust race for our Senate seat, uh, <laughs> if he doesn't run for Senate, uh, you must pencil in the Republican for the Senate seat in West Virginia, because that's exactly what's going to happen. There's no other viable Democratic candidate for that office. Uh, whether or not he has the ability to do it, given uh, the very salient point that Bill Stubblefield made, I would uh, I'd be in agreement with that. I, I think he's rubbed too many Democrats the wrong way to win any primary race outside of a very few, perhaps, in, in this country. Alonzo? I think that, uh, you know, the, running for president is probably his best bet. I, I don't think that uh, running for Senate is even worth the, the you know, the heartache, the, the money that's going to be thrown into the race. I think that, you know, in the hearts of West Virginians, I think they're about tired of Joe Manchin. And I think that, you know, he's had the opportunity to get his name out there. He's got, you know, national recognized celebrity right now being the guy in the middle. I think that if he does it correctly, um, you know, and can somehow be a voice of reason, maybe take more progressive uh, positions on certain issues uh, in the primary for, you know, the Democratic Party. I do think he has a chance, you know. Uh, the Democratic Party is lost all of its appeal with rural Americans. And uh, if he were to, you know, uh, recapture that in their party, I think that it would be a, a net benefit for their party. Um, would I vote for Joe Manchin? Not a chance. And uh, I'll just leave it with that but when when polled americans say they would like parties to work together and they're in favor of a more moderate approach to how government works experts seem to agree that only about eight to ten percent of each political party the major parties is fringe with the majority regarding themselves as being somewhere in the middle the hypocrisy of that is, when we discuss this issue, it's unanimous that Joe Manchin, widely considered as probably the most well-known moderate in the country, has zero chance of becoming president. So, where is, is, are the people being polled hypocrites? Are they actually not really as much in the middle as they say they are? Do they not really want a moderate to run things as much as they say they do? Well... Bonus question. Uh, the, the question, well, the, and, and the... Poll, that's because polls are totally inaccurate and corrupt because a lot of people who, who would support Joe Manchin wouldn't respond. I wouldn't respond. I don't respond even when they preface it saying it's a conservative inquiry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think if we could get away from the primary, Joe Manchin would be a very viable candidate. But I do not believe, and my question about uh, Cheney, I knew the answer, uh, your reaction to that, Mike, because that's the last, you would fall to your death before you go for this, Cheney. <laughs> hey, final but, thoughts, get them ready here. we got to get to the last commercial break.